morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of EU Green Week and this virtual conference discussing zero pollution for healthier people and planet. I'm delighted to welcome you from wherever you're joining us to follow this session 7.2 on burning wood to heat our homes, challenges and solutions to limit indoor and outdoor air pollution. For people who haven't followed any of my sessions so far, I'm Aminda Lee. I'm a British Italian uh, journalist and moderator based in Rome, and I'm specialised in environmental topics. And here today, the weather is glorious, certainly not for burning a wood stove. Before I explain how this session starts, I'm going to uh, give some practical announcements, though I imagine you're already uh, quite familiar with the situation if you've been following uh, Green Week so far. You can send in your questions via Slido. Um, please use the QR code on the auditorium screens that you're following us on, or you can go to www.slido and insert the code EU Green Week 2021, and then choose session 7.2, which is ours. The codes are also in the virtual rooms that you're following us from. You can also vote on other people's questions, and what I will try and do is go to the ones with the top votes first. Uh, so uh, if there's one that you really want me to ask, keep voting for it. And of course, you can spread the news about what you're hearing in this session on Twitter with the hashtag EU Green Week. Now, while we tend to think that we're safe from pollution inside our homes, that of course is not true. And if we burn wood for heating, we could be producing harmful concentrations of air pollutants in the very place where we should usually feel most protected. The COVID-19 lockdowns forcing us to stay at home have again highlighted the importance of making sure the indoor and outdoor air that we breathe is clean at all times. And with the insulation of buildings improving, ensuring good air quality indoors will become even more important in the future. We're going to start this session with some short presentations on the different facets and challenges related to burning wood to heat our homes and the indoor and outdoor pollution it can cause. We're going to hear about the EU's stance on the topic, learn about the health risks from this type of pollution, discover what local authorities are doing, find out the position of manufacturers of wood burning heating appliances, and hear the outcomes of the EU funded Clean Heat project. After that, I'll be coming to your questions for the panel discussion. And just before we start, I would like to clarify one thing before I introduce our speakers. You will probably hear the word stove used a lot in this discussion. To avoid confusion for English mother tongue speakers, we are not talking about the thing that you cook your dinner on here. Um, stove is the industry term for an appliance that heats a specific room. So in other words, a heater, whereas boilers are used to heat multiple environments. So your whole house. So now I've clarified that, let's see who's on our panel this morning. Uh, so we have Françoise Wackenhut, who is head of the Clean Air Unit at DG Environment in the European Commission. Please say hello. Good morning. Uh, we have Vlatka Matkovic, who is Senior Health and Energy Officer at the NGO Health and Environmental Alliance, or HEAL. Hello, hello. You may have seen them in yesterday's session on Towards Clean Air in the Western Balkans. Then we have Guido Lanzani, who is head of the Air Quality Unit within the Environmental Monitoring Area of the Lombardy Regional Protection Agency, or ARPA Lombardia. Hello. We have Ryan Gelton, who is Secretary General of the European Committee of Manufacturers and Domestic Heating and Cooking Appliances, or SHIFCAD. Hello, everybody. And finally, we have Patrick Hoot, who is coordinator of the Clean Heat Project, which was a finalist in the Life Awards announced at Green Week yesterday. Good morning. So I'm going to start off the session by asking Francoise Wackenhut to give us a short overview of how EU legislation addresses wood burning. After all, uh, biomass, which includes wood, is currently the main renewable energy source in the EU, so it's closely connected to the Green Deal. The virtual floor is now yours, Francois. 
Thank you very much, Shaminda. Good morning. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, addressing this important topic. So you set the scene extremely clearly, Aminda. Um, it is uh, very well established that wood burning emits air pollutants, including some of the most damaging ones to our health. For instance, fine particulate matter. And we all know, I think around this table and in the virtual room, that air pollution from all sources leads to around 400,000 premature deaths per year in the EU alone. It would be obviously unacceptable to consider that this is normal and that we can um, basically accept that reality. However, what is also clear, as you just said now, is that biomass, including wood, is the main renewable energy source in the EU and will continue to hold a large share as renewable energy sources increase together. So wood burning for domestic heating is an activity that does merit all our attention and focus in order to fulfill the so-called do no harm principle set in the European Green Deal. And from the European Commission's perspective, we are fully committed to reducing pollution and ensuring consistency across all initiatives that affect it. So that is the so-called policy coherence principle. The session today is at the heart of several recent and important policy initiatives at EU level. There is obviously in the first place, the EGD, the European Green Deal, which states that, and I'm quoting here, it aims to protect, conserve and enhance the EU's natural capital and protect the health and well-being of citizens from environment related risks and impacts, end of quote. But the Green Deal also establishes a very important principle, the do no harm green oath. And it reminds us that the objective there is to ensure that all Green Deal initiatives achieve their objectives in the most effective and least burdensome way. So the session today is about how to make sure our homes are heated with renewable energy and that renewable energy does not hinder but rather enhances our capacity to breathe clean air and remain healthy. The commitments under the Green Deal have been reiterated, they've actually been deepened just a few weeks ago with the adoption of the Zero Pollution Action Plan, which includes a dedicated target to reduce by more than 55% the health impacts which we express in premature death, as you heard earlier, of air pollution by 2030 compared to 2005. So we want to reduce it by at least 55%. This is a commitment that can be achieved only if everyone plays its role, only if the clean air legislation that we've got already in place is fully implemented, and if member states deliver on all aspects and measures they have announced to implement it. So in order to fulfill both our climate change and cleaner objectives, the EU level, member states, regions, but also all actors from the sector, including, of course, producers and ourselves as consumers, have to further develop instruments and best practices in the wood burning sector. This is precisely what we'll do today. And I think that this is important to hear how much can be yielded from what we know already. On the commission side, we have a full commitment to implementing the binding legislation that is already in place from national emission reduction commitments to ambient air quality, but also what we call source specific legislation. So that is the legislation that targets specific areas of emissions and that covers, of course, the areas that we're discussing today, because they're covered by legislation on so-called eco-design or energy labeling legislation, which specifically target heating appliances and are to be reviewed soon as well. So today's discussions will certainly also inform our considerations on what possible next steps and improvements, because improvements can no doubt be made, we should consider. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed. As you say, it's all about everybody working together. And in this session, we have all the different players, uh, or certainly some of the most important ones represented, or their voice will be heard. So uh, this is a way of kicking off the discussions. And I certainly know that we're going to be talking a little bit more about eco design and also eco labeling, among other things during this session. Um, so we've heard a little bit about the health risks from bioenergy uh, combustion, in particular wood burning in the domestic setting. But now let's focus in a little bit more about what that actually means in practice. Uh, and to do this, uh, I'd like to turn to Vlatka Matkovic from HEAL. Uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm Vlatka and I will be speaking about health impacts of biomass burning. And with that, I would just like to first start with uh, my organization, Health and Environment Alliance. So we are an umbrella organization of different groups uh, in Europe. So from doctors, patients, nurses, public health institutes. And why am I mentioning this is that there is a large amount of health professionals who are working on air pollution, outdoor and as well indoor. So we are looking at uh, different sources and really um, looking how they're uh, affecting our health and advocating, of course, for the cleaner air. Uh, some of our uh, members, if you see that uh, this is working. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, our big groups like European Respir Respiratory Society and so on and so on. Mm, so this was just to give you an um, idea that there are doctors and health professionals working on this field. And with that, um, I would like to mention WHO or World Health Organization that has um, guidelines for outdoor air pollution, which you might be familiar with, with and this is uh, wide use, uh, widely used in Europe for, for different kind of health impact assessments, but there is also uh, indoor uh, gui uh, guidelines for indoor air pollution, which is tackling some other uh, air pollutants. Um, and those two basically needs to be linked. Um, what, um, as we know, like uh, we are living in our house, homes most of the time, um, even though um, outdoor air pollution is definitely one, one of the main risks for health, uh, we cannot just forget about indoor air pollution. So um, those stoves that we are using for, for biomass burning or other solid fuels burning can emit different pollutants into the air directly. So basically through leakages. Um, so they can be inefficient or yeah, not efficient enough. Just uh, you are opening up these doors and then the smoke is coming also in your house. And this all has effect on, on your health. And not just that, but also once you burn something, this smoke goes out of your chimney. But where? In your in, uh, outdoor air, uh, air, right? So you are opening your window to, to ventilate your, uh, your home and the smoke is coming basically in. So you, again, you are exposed to different kind of uh, pollution. Um, the, the, those can be like small particles that are entering our body via lungs and then they can either produce um, uh, lung diseases like um, asthma attacks, bronchitis, uh, lung cancer, and so on. Or they can even be, the smallest particles can be via blood transferred to, to the brain. And of course, uh, we heard about strokes um, being caused by um, air pollution. So all of those are significant uh, significant impacts on health and a large number of people are affected because everybody breathes air right around us. Um, uh, one more thing is that um, scientists are recently working on a low level of exposure to air pollution, mainly outdoor, but still it's very important to mention this that there is no safe level of air pollution. So even the lowest level of air pollution are causing significant health harm. Um, yeah, so um, 
And yes, as Francois mentioned, um, zero pollution, zero harm from pollution, zero money to pollution, and zero delay to stopping pollution is one of the main uh, main asks of health groups that are uh, advocating for zero pollution within Green Deal, uh, which means also tackling this in all sectors, not just uh, large combustion plants or big industrial sites, but also domestic wood burning that uh, greatly affect uh, our uh, quality of our air. And uh, definitely there needs to be more attention to policy related to indoor air quality. So far, a lot of uh, attention among different groups and also policies is into outdoor air quality, but not so much indoor. It really stays uh, at the back of our mind. Uh, we see that also that um, data that is coming out from you know, about biomass burning in domestic stoves for residential heating is um, scarce, is not uh, comprehensive enough. Based on that, of course, our health impact assessments cannot be, uh, can be basically an estimates and not really, um, uh, we have problems into into really quantifying how much uh, domestic burning is is uh, um, having a what's the burden of health effects um, to the population. Um, there was one big health study that looked at premature deaths from different energy sources per terawatt hour of um, produced electricity in EU and uh, uh, US. And as we see and we know this, that lignite and coal produce really enormous amounts uh, air, of air pollution, and this will have then uh, enormous amounts of health effects. So these numbers, 30 for lignite and coal, 25 are per terawatt hour. So um, those who know a bit about electricity production in uh, Europe, this will mount to really large, large uh, amounts of uh, premature debt yearly. But biomass, even though we are looking at it as, um, as a renewable source and somehow it goes into clean, clean energy, it does still produce uh, health effects. It, it is less definitely from lignite and coal. This needs to be phased out as soon as possible. But biomass cannot be just overlooked. We have to see it, whether we want to tackle this problem now and not invest in, a, in, um, in actions that will keep on bi um, biomass in, in, the, in the energy picture, or we will start some kind of movement around energy savings, energy efficiency, and switching the fuels to something that is uh, cleaner and has less health effects. Same with the gas. So uh, we really need to uh, bring this discussion up and bring um, all the arguments for um, all of the other possible energy sources, not only those that are mentioned in, the, in this slide as most, uh, uh, most affecting our health. And my last point <coughs> on biomass is um, that there is difference between how biomass is uh, used in West, Western Europe and how biomass is uh, used in Eastern Europe or uh, accession countries such as uh, Western Balkans. And there is clear difference of um, burden of the or prevalence of uh, indoor air pollution within, within that. Um, it mainly relates to energy poverty. So whether you have efficient stoves, whether your um, source of energy comes from wood and there is no other option for clean energy, or you have option and wood is only used as a kind of um, atmospheric uh, burning, um, having in um, uh, some furnaces, a little bit of fire, so you have a romantic dinner. Um, so that, that, that is, the, we have to see this also from the point of view of uh, investments, like how much needs to be invested then in uh, Eastern Europe to change the picture of burden of uh, indoor air quality and um, how much it needs to, um, it will cost then for Western Europe to, to do the same. 
And with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. And yeah, as you can see, you can get in touch with us. Thank you very much indeed, Vlatka. Uh, and obviously send in your questions. I see that they're already starting to come in uh, and do vote on the questions that uh, you would really like to be answered first. Um, uh, the thing that struck me from what you were, you were saying there is that there is no safe level of air pollution and that really struck me. Um, so we're, we'll be going on uh, probably and discussing that a little bit more. Um, so now we've heard about the health effects, which are considerable. Um, and now let's try and think about what the role of regional and local authorities have in tackling and reducing air pollution from domestic wood burning. Um, to give us some practical examples from the ground and also reflect further on that social dimension that we just started to hear about, um, uh, I'm now going to introduce uh, Guido Lanzani uh, from the Lombardy Regional Protection Agency. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, so, uh, where we are, uh, we are in uh, Lombardia. Lombardia is in the center of Po Valley. It has 10 million of inhabitants. In the center of Lombardia, there is the city of Milano, 1.3 million of inhabitants. Uh, despite uh, a progressive reduction of pollutants, we still have problems with PM10. In Milano, we exceed the, the limit more than 80 days every year. But we have a problem also with benzoapyrene that is linked to wood burning. We have problem with benzoapyrene not in the city, but in the valleys and where uh, wood burning is uh, more used. Uh, wood burning is responsible of of uh, more or less half of primary PM10 emitted every year in uh, our region, and more than 67% of annual BHP emitted in our region. So it's the fourth source of, PM, of primary PM10 and of benzoipirin. So uh, what are the main challenges that uh, we have to focus? First of all, co cultural. Uh, people believes, be, believe that uh, wood burning is good, uh, is green, and so it is difficult to do something uh, uh, for uh, limit this source because politicians obviously uh, feel uh, uh, what people uh, think. And so it is very important to improve uh, uh, the uh, knowledge and the awareness of uh, people. Uh, it is also important uh, uh, to uh, teach people to use wood well, because uh, uh, if you don't use wood, wood we we well, uh, it is very difficult uh, and you have much more emissions. We have also a uh, problem with the uh, uh, legal uh, rules, because it is not simple for us uh, to enter in the houses and to check if uh, wood is used well. We have a problem uh, uh, from an economical point of view, because wood costs less than uh, natural gas. So uh, it, it is a choice uh, of people also for, for these reasons. We have also technical problems because it is not simple to check uh, if uh, a stove uh, emits a lot or not. And so it is important also to develop uh, uh, methods to measure real emissions of stoves. Uh, we have also technological problems because it is important uh, to develop step by step better stoves uh, to, to have the possibility really to use them without uh, damage a lot air quality. So what we try to do in, in Lombardia? Uh, we try to act on three pillars. First of all, we try to improve uh, stoves and fireplaces. How? Uh, first of all, we define uh, emission classes. So we have stoves of two, three, four, five stars. Uh, after that, uh, we put uh, stricter rules for uh, the installation of new stoves. Now in Lombardia, you can use only four stars, we say uh, stoves. So uh, stoves better than uh, the stoves required by uh, eco-design rules. Then uh, we also uh, 
decide a progressive ban for the most emitting stoves. So if you have an old stove, you have to change it. Uh, naturally, we try to uh, give incentive to this operation, paying a part of, this, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of the cost of, this, of substitution. It is important also the correct use of stoves. Uh, from this point of view, we develop communication campaigns. Uh, we put rules on maintenance because it is very important also to maintain well uh, the, the stove, the chimney. It is very important uh, uh, to uh, use good uh, um, wood uh, without humidity, good pellet, we saw that uh, if you use a better pellet, the emissions are really lower than if you use uh, the worst uh, normal pellet. We also uh, have a compulsory registry of stove. Everyone have to register uh, his stove in this register. And uh, so for us, it is possible also to give money if uh, someone change his stove without uh, um, uh, changing the, the, the worst one, I mean. It is also very important to increase public awareness. So we do a lot of communication campaigns. We uh, try to be present on mass media. Uh, we participate to workshop and so on and so on. Uh, we also uh, decide a ban of the worst stoves during air pollution episodes. Uh, this measure is important for the results during air pollution measures, but also to convince people that uh, it is important to use wood well and, and uh, that not only traffic is a problem, but also wood, if not used well, is a problem. During air pollution episode, a lot of, of uh, newspapers, mass media uh, speak about uh, the problem and so uh, helps us uh, to uh, increase public awareness on this topic. Uh, some good news, uh, the change of paradigm with the producers. Uh, in, when we uh, put the first uh, ban of the worst stoves in uh, 2006, uh, the, one of the main producers in um, Italy uh, paid the, for uh, a whole page on uh, our principal newspaper, Corriere della Sera, writing, uh, President, what is uh, the thing that does not uh, pollute, uh, uh, that is environmental friendly and so on and so on, the wood. But now uh, what they do uh, with us, they try to develop uh, a certification of uh, firewood and pellet. They work with us uh, to uh, the certification of stoves. I said before that uh, we have uh, a system of stars uh, to, um, to check if a stove is, is good or not good. And uh, we tr they try to work with us uh, to improve also uh, the quality of the man uh, maintenance uh, with uh, courses for uh, installators and maintainers. So it is really a change. If we work together to producers, it is possible, it is possible to improve, improve uh, uh, the system and to decrease the emission of this source. Uh, also, uh, we work uh, uh, to um, decrease the emission from wood in a life project, uh, life prepare project. We develop uh, some actions uh, uh, on the education of uh, installers, uh, but also we develop uh, a um, campaign on mass media and uh, uh, web uh, to uh, increase public awareness. Uh, we develop a video, brochures and so on, brochures on, on web. Uh, we think that in this way we can really uh, do a step towards uh, a system in which wood can be used without adverse effect. Again, um, towards air quality. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh,
Thank you, Guido. And we'll be coming back to you. I'm sure there are already lots of questions coming in. It's obviously a topic that is uh, inspiring the audience and they want to know more. Um, uh, I thought it was very interesting. You, you've obviously uh, introduced a lot of measures in uh, Lombardy. Maybe we can uh, think of about how that could be maybe scaled up to a kind of EU level. Um, uh, but we can discuss that in a moment, uh, because obviously the, an important factor in all of this um, uh, is the design of the wood burning appliances. And of course, that is just as important as their correct installation, their proper use, uh, including burning the right fuel, as we just heard from Guido. And of course, regular maintenance, uh, which again we've heard has been introduced as uh, compulsory in Lombardy. So what are the manufacturers of domestic and heating cooking appliances doing to limit air pollution from domestic wood burning? To answer that question and tell us more, I'm now going to turn to Ryan Gelton, the Secretary General of the European Committee representing the industry. Hello. Hello, Amanda, thank you. Um, yes, from the uh, manufacturer side, the CFSD, uh, we are called, which is the European Trade Organization for local space heaters. So it's uh, we're not just dealing with biomass appliances, but also with uh, other type of fuels and appliances. And the title of my presentation is Residential Biomass Heating Part of the Solution. And we heard it already from Francois. Um, biomass is a big part of the solution when we talk about renewable energies in the European Union today. So a little bit more about um, our industry. Um, just some facts, and I think I have to use the slider now. It's disabled, so maybe you can use it, uh, Aminda, for me to go to the next page. Um, yes, yeah, some facts about uh, our industry. Um, I think there's a confusing and incorrect dialogue on biomass burning. Um, if you look at the whole um, discussion, there's a lot of talk about um, co-firing of biomass in uh, electricity plants, um, industrial use of biomass, outdoor use of biomass, and it's all blamed on the stove. So I think we should be very critical on that. It's not all that. Also, even uh, the WHO sometimes does that uh, by mixing coal stoves and wood stoves all together in, uh, in the figures, which is not correct. Um, so there's a little bit of a stigma on the wood burning stove, um, which we should get rid of. Um, it was already said heating with wooden pellets is the second most important way of residential heating. It's about 15% of the total, um, which is quite big in the European Union. Um, there are three major countries that represent almost 50% of the total use of uh, domestic biomass heating, which are France, Germany and Italy. So uh, um, three big chunks here in these countries. Um, we also have to look at the fuel, which is locally available. It's CO2 neutral, if you compare that to oil and gas. And it's a short cycled fuel. So in 20 to 25 years, um, uh, a new tree is growing versus the oil and gas, which took billions of years to, uh, to establish and which we are still using in the majority today. Um, domestic wood burning is a huge contributor to the EU renewable energy targets. Also not forget that. Um, if you look at the market um, in, uh, let's say, the last 10 years, then we see that wood log burning is declining and that pellet burning, so the use of pellets, is, uh, is up. And I've put some small pictures underneath of my presentation because uh, I um, often experience that people don't really know what these appliances are looking uh, uh, like so uh, if you look at the first two pictures on the left that's wood burning and on the right that's pellet burning it's not so easy to see but uh, pellets are small pre-produced uh, particles of wood which are burnt uh, in, a, in a more let's say electric way um, so you can measure it better you can uh, dose it better and then on acre design for appliances that starts only in january 2022 so quite late we're still not yet there and if you look at the open, uh, if you look at the rules for uh, for eco design, then still open fires are in there, which is of course a disgrace, and still 30% efficiency is allowed, which is uh, yeah, I would say with 10 years back with uh, with eco design, we should have progressed far far further than we are today, when we still leave that uh, 
into the market, uh, we should really cut that out because it's not uh, um, acceptable anymore. Areas to improve, I think everybody wants to know that. Um, in the industry, we always look at four pillars. That's not only the appliance. The appliance is only, let's say, 25% or maybe even less of the, uh, uh, the whole thing. It's also installation, which is extremely important. If you have a perfect appliance with a lousy installation, you have a lousy installation altogether. So um, just an, a good appliance is not working. Also the fuel, what's put in the appliance, and we also heard that um, from Vladka and I think also Guido's presentation. Um, I think there's a, a big difference how people are using their product also in intensity and the way they use it throughout Europe and Northern Europe or Southern Europe or Western and Eastern Europe, there are a lot of differences. But what I want to say is that the focus is now only on the appliance and we should get rid of that because we should focus on the four pillars, that's the appliance, the installation, the fuel, and also the operator, the user. Um, some facts about that. None of the 27 EU countries have legal requirements for installers of the appliances. In other way, everybody can just put an appliance in a home. There are no rules, no legal rules for that. That's impossible, I would say. Then 25 out of 27 EU, EU countries have no legal requirements for the maintenance of these appliances. So if you put in a new installation, but you never maintain it, then after one to two years, it's just not delivering what it should be, not in efficiency, not in emissions. Um, these are complex appliances, certainly the modern ones, because they have a lot of electronics in them. They have uh, a lot of smart facilities, but if they are not maintained, they will not deliver. It's the same as a car. Um, if you buy a car and you never maintain it, it will not have the emissions like it had when it came out of the factory. Um, so you have in these appliances, you have seals, you have baffle plates, you have uh, interior insulation, you have air controls that needs to be maintained to keep emissions low and efficiency high. Then the EU norms, the standards of the appliances, they are more than 20 years old. They've never been adapted. We're always apparently fighting to get these, these adapted. We should finally do something about that. And um, we've seen that some countries luckily have implemented local standards like Italy is very far with that. Also, Germany, um, uh, mainly the German-speaking countries, have done something about it. But we should have a, a very strong EU policy on norms and standards and not leave that to individual countries. Then another area, outside burning, fun burning, I would say, that is growing fast. Uh, nobody's talking about that, but uh, there are 10 times as many outdoor burning devices than indoor burning devices, such as chimeneas, fire pits, uh, other kind of stuff. The contribution of that to uh, renewable energy is, of course, is absolutely zero and it is causing a lot of emissions. So I think that should get attention as well. And how can we reduce the emissions by 80%? I think we have to set requirements for the installers and for the installation of appliances. Installers should be educated and um, uh, only educated installers should be able to install appliances. Also, we have we need requirements for the maintenance of appliances. I think it's very normal that like you have an MOT for cars, that there is also some kind of MOT for appliances of this kind, for these complex type of appliances, that they are maintained well so that they can deliver low emissions and high efficiencies during their lifetime. Also, the standards for appliances should be speeded up. Um, we should not have to wait 22 years to get new norms or we should not wait for eco design norms that come in 22 and that are just not up to standard. It is just not enough. So that should go faster. Um, also, I would be in favor of making a green deal with the industry. The industry is very willing. They want exactly the same as everybody else. They want clean appliances. They want good installation. They want low emissions. Um, we are working towards an, a European quality label for appliances, which goes a lot further than uh, EcoDesign. And we need also the support of the European Union there. Um, we like to make deals on education of installers, on technical developments, uh, etc. So we're open to discuss that and to make a green deal with the European Union on that. Um, also replacement programs. Uh, we saw it in Italy can be extremely uh, effective. We've calculated here, for example, in the Netherlands, which is not such a big biomass country, but in, uh, we see a lot of old appliances. The majority of appliances is older than 20 years. Replacing 10% of these appliances with new appliances would be 50% less emissions. So 
Um, that's probably throughout the European Union or even bigger uh, gains to be um, get. Uh, we should do something about the um, outdoor growing fun use, uh, which causes very high commission, uh, very high emissions, very high black carbon emissions. Um, I think there's an opportunity to make biomass burning um, an indoor heating part of the solution, and we should talk more about the solutions than we talk about the problems. Um, if we do all these, that would mean reduced emissions, greater efficiency, and also we need less fuel and we can have more appliances using less fuel. That was my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry we had some technical problems with that presentation, uh, but it will be available uh, for you, people to go through. But you certainly explained all the contents of it, and that's the most important thing. Um, there are obviously a lot of challenges there. Um, one of the things that came out um, that you mentioned is the fact that there are no EU norms on this and countries are doing uh, their own thing, which doesn't seem like a, a good recipe for joined up uh, policy making uh, from this angle anyway. Uh, now, one of the things that we've heard is that people do not really connect air pollution with wood burning um, for various reasons. Um, so how can we actually raise awareness about this? And our final speaker, Patrick Hood, has plenty of ideas um, with, as his work as coordinator of the Green Heat Project. Please tell us more about the project and also about the role that consumers have to play. Thanks, Amanda. So in my presentation, I will speak about awareness raising and also about the role of buyers and users of domestic wood burning appliances. And I will in particular focus on uh, stoves because um, this type of appliance is the most relevant with regard to the emissions. So first of all, it's important to understand the perspective of consumers with regard to um, stoves and what notions and myths are linked to that. And first of all, um, of course, uh, burning wood um, is linked to coziness, so people like the heat of a stove at home. And um, we also heard already the, the issue of um, or the, the aspect of climate neutrality. And many people think that it's beneficial to the climate if they are using a stove. But that's um, not true because we have uh, substantial emissions of black carbon, which is a climate forcer and uh, harmful to the climate. So. Um, that's often uh, neglected in this debate. And um, what's also uh, yeah, in the public debate is that um, we just have to get rid of the old stoves and um, replace them with new ones because uh, they are claimed as, as, new, as being low emission. And um, that's also not the case. Um, I will get, the, uh, get back to that in uh, a few uh, seconds. And um, of course, Mm, many people have uh, also access, um, easy access to wood. So for them, it's an inexpensive fuel and therefore, um, yeah, it's, it's an advantage to, to use that um, uh, for uh, yeah, producing heat. Um, often we also heard the, the aspect of energy independence. So um, people don't want to be dependent on a centralized heat source. So that, therefore they would like to have a stove in their home. Um, but what we also already heard in the um, discussion or in the uh, presentations before is that sometimes um, there are consumers that don't have any other heating options. So this um, issue is of, often linked to uh, energy poverty. So the question is, um, what can um, owners and buyers of uh, um, stoves uh, do to um, reduce air pollution? And um, I would just mention some of the activities that we did in our Clean Heat campaign to raise awareness and to improve uh, their role or yeah, their behavior. So we, um, we created leaflets, we produced um, a short film, we created a mobile exhibition, we um, made um, some, some, exp some, some talks um, in uh, municipalities um, so to inform citizens about that issue. And we also um, had a broad range of media activities uh, to address that. And we tried to convey uh, specific messages. Um, first of all, to raise awareness about the environmental impact. So the air in outdoor and indoor air pollution. Um, we also tried to provide knowledge for, um, yeah, for, for help, helping consumers to make an informed buying decision. And also what's very important to consider alternatives. And um, if people already have a stove, then of course it's important to teach them to burn right. So um, 
there are a couple of aspects that have to be considered with burning, right? So the fuel um, has to be um, from a sustainable source. It has to be uh, dry. It has to have the right size. You also have to um, consider the combustion air, the right amount of wood. And what's already mentioned before, uh, the maintenance and regular cleaning is also uh, very important. And what proved to be very effective in our cleaning campaign was to include multipliers um, in these information campaigns. So we collaborated with chimney sweeps, with uh, DIY stores and local environmental officers to really get in touch with the target uh, group, with the consumers. So that was um, very effective. But um, yeah, if you speak about, um, if you speak of um, awareness raising, um, we also have to um, uh, say that there are limits of awareness raising and um, of burning right, uh, stuff like that. Because um, the key problem is, even if someone buys a new stove and operates it properly, this all, uh, stove uh, emits too much uh, particulate matter and black carbon. And to illustrate that, um, I included a chart uh, with the comparison of um, stove and uh, diesel cars. And um, it's based on, or you can see the, the particulate matter emissions in gram per hour. Uh, based on the limit values that are measured in the laboratory. And as you can see, a stove complying to the eco-design requirements, um, which are um, in place uh, next year, um, is allowed to emit as twice as much uh, particles um, compared to a diesel car um, with Euro 3, which uh, for, from the year 2000. And the difference is even uh, larger if you compare it to a newer diesel car with Euro 5 or 6, um, which usually are equipped with a filter. And um, I think this uh, issue was also mentioned before, and that's, that's the uh, values that are measured in the laboratory. If you uh, take a look at uh, real life emissions, and we know that from several other um, projects, the emissions of stoves are, are much higher, so the, the problem gets even worse. So the question, of course, is if new stoves um, um, are not acceptable from a health perspective and from a climate perspective, what could we recommend to, to um, consumers if they still want to have a stove? So um, in our project, we tried to, to yeah, find a solution for that. And we um, initiated a new eco-label, um, the Blue Angel eco-label for stoves. And this eco-label has a very ambitious award criteria, which were published in uh, early 2020. And in the meantime, four stove models are, are available. And um, with this Blue Angel Eco label, buyers now have for the first time the possibility to choose a stove with included exhaust cleaning, so with the filter and precipitator. Um, and this exhaust cleaning technology is necessary because the um, award criteria include very strict limit values and a more realistic measurement procedure compared to the uh, t usual type approval of stoves. In addition, it includes an automatic air regulation or combustion air control to avoid incorrect use. So this uh, Blue Angel Eco label is only a first step uh, because we think that this um, Eco label should be used as a blueprint for the revision of the um, eco design requirements and make exhaust cleaning um, to be mandatory. Um, because otherwise, um, I don't think that these type of blinds uh, will have any future. So the, the conclusion of this is awareness raising is, is important, of course, but um, awareness raising should um, especially focus on, on uh, generating policy support for more ambitious requirements, legal requirements for these appliances. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Patrick. I'm going to go straight to questions uh, because we've got more than 14 in, which is a lot. Uh, um, one of the ones which has the main votes is uh, wood burning is often seen as climate friendly alternative. Also like diesel cars were promoted before. Uh, how can we bring out the pollution side and the pollution problems better? And just connected to that was uh, a question sent in from Anya, and it says, when does the EU accept that EU admits more CO2 than other sources and is not climate, climate neutral, the EU must stop subsidizing wood? Uh, so, but just talking about the um, how we can bring out the problems and the understanding about wood burning and the health issues. I don't know who wants to, who would like to, Vladka, would you like to start us off on that one? Okay. Um... 
Well, maybe one way to go forward is to um, link it to air pollution because uh, inevitably climate effects will also have um, something to do with air pollution too. So pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions are linked. Um, and then bring it to a health, uh, health um, evidence that exists. So th that is one thing. And then other thing also in, in terms of uh, wood burning, what really is not touched by anybody here is that we do destroy our uh, forests by it, right? In some countries even more uh, than others that have uh, good planning for, for biomass um, usages. So th th this again links to health. We cannot live without uh, green spaces, right? So mm -hmm. maybe that, that is one, one link. What we value as the most, like in some countries, really a connection to nature, going to the woods would be something that, yeah. But I guess other uh, participants who have um, raised awareness among the population can, yeah. Further. Patrick, do you have any ideas for us since you, you're so good at uh, awareness raising, though you say it does have limits? Yeah, so, so basically I think um, what's very important is to um, also limit the use of biomass in the European legislation. To, so for instance, in the Renewable Energy Directive, um, it has to be, this, this issue has to be addressed because we see that many member states try to um, fulfill their requirements for renewables with uh, burning, yeah, with, with uh, biomass burning. And that's, that's a huge problem because um, as mentioned before, the, the forests are already, or the use of, of the forest is, is limited and, uh, yeah, but uh, what we what we've seen in the in the in our campaign was uh, that especially this this climate impact um, is often neglected both by consumers and and policymakers and um, therefore I think it's it's important to communicate that um, with an integrated approach we could tackle um, both uh, this climate issue and uh, the, this health issue and um, I think that's important in the in the in, as a message. And um, I'm going to come to you, Ryan, in a minute. And um, uh, there are various questions about the design of stoves, which I think is obviously relevant from your side. But Guido, I wanted to um, put a question to you. And, and in, OK, we're, we're talking about long body, but actually, I think that the question could be addressed to anybody. It says the impact of biomass on burning, uh, burning on particulate matter in Lombardy is well known for more than one decade. Why are, um, why are the measures to abate this sort not enforced more strictly? Really, uh, we try to enforce them strictly. Uh, the problem is, first of all, uh, the, the possibility to check what there is in the houses because we uh, put strict uh, rules on new installation and we think that the new installation fulfill these rules. Because uh, if you go in our markets now, you find only four or five star stoves, so uh, stoves better than the eco-design stoves uh, uh, required by EU legislation. The problem is with existing stoves. Uh, we put rules on that, but it is, as I said before, it is very difficult to go inside the houses and uh, to, 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 to ask to people to change their stoves. Uh, we try also to give money to do that. Uh, really, it is not simple even if you pay the whole cost of a new stove. Uh, uh, for, this reason, for these reasons, it is very important to increase public awareness because only if we have people with us, it is possible really to change the things. Okay, thank you. So it's all public, public awareness. Um, I, I mean, I think well this is this session is also part of that realizing uh that actually um uh, it was certainly for us in the west where you know, as you say it might be more luxury that we're having wood burning rather than necessity uh but um, we we don't quite make that connection yet um just talking about the design of stoves um uh there have been a few questions in which i'm going to put to you ryan uh which is which i now have to try and find them um that someone was talking about um what is the potential for combining low emission stoves with filters appliances at affordable prices so the idea is we want to have stoves that are not going to be polluting that are not emit emitting things but that are affordable for people how uh, how how practical is that 
Ryan, switch on your microphone. No, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Switch your microphone on. There you are. Okay. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, just uh, on, on the previous discussion, I know there's little time, but on, on the forest, why can't we have production forests? I think that countries like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, uh, Sweden, Norway um, have proven that they, they can do a lot with biomass and the forests are not declining. On the contrary, they're growing very, very fast. Um, yeah, we can, of course, have nuclear power plants and do something with the waste or get a, a gas from Russia, but why not? have the fuel right on our doorstep. So that's just what I wanted to say about that. Uh, next thing is, yes, for new appliances, certainly we can do quite a lot. Um, the thing is for the old appliances, if you will look at the filter systems, etc., we've done numerous researches. There has been very a lot of research. It's very difficult uh, to make an old stove clean um, with filter systems, etc. And one of the things is that you need very experienced installers to do that because it has to do not only with the appliance, but uh, especially with the uh, exhaust channel. So is it wide enough? Does it uh, give enough draw in the chimney, et cetera, et cetera? So that is complicated. For new products, there's a lot more to do. If you look at the, the I would say, the latest modern pellet stoves and also wood stove with electronic combustion control, then you see that they are at least half of eco design or even less in, in the output. Obviously, that needs also proper installation. Otherwise, uh, you will not get the uh, the figures that you need. So there is a lot of opportunity there. Absolutely. And, and just uh, coming to you about the point about uh, real world emissions and lab test emissions, because there have been a couple of questions on that. Um, yeah. Why is there this discrepancy and what can be done to make it um, so that what you say is emitted is really what's emitted or as close as possible obviously given all the other factors involved i think you always need standards to measure things uh, against and it is very difficult to do that um, in similar circumstances that is why we have these lab tests so that uh, in all the lab tests uh, uh, manufacturers are measuring against with the same measuring equipment against the same standards in the same circumstances with the same bra in the chimney etc cetera, etc cetera. to copy that at home is of course difficult you, you, you will always have even different weather conditions different temperatures uh, maybe slightly different fuel different chimney uh, configurations etc so that's why it is very difficult to copy that at home that is also why I'm pushing so much on these four pillars. That is why installation is so important because, for example, all the measurements are done with 12 Pascal. If you install a new chimney at home and you do not something about it, you have 40 Pascal. So you have to put something in there to, to get that at 12 Pascal. You will uh, certainly know that with 40 Pascal, you will not have the same efficiency as with 12. So therefore, that's important. A professional installer will look at that and will make sure that um the, the chimney is delivering in in uh, the way it should so that's just okay, one example patrick many. sorry I, we're coming to the end so i want to just uh, patrick can i come back to you on that and then we're going to have to start rounding up uh, yeah just to, uh, add a few words on on this uh, testing procedure for stoves i think there are a couple of things that have to be changed for instance the test cycle is completely artificial um, there are different pollutants that are not included in the, in the uh, testing. So for instance, black carbon, ultra fine particles are not specifically measured. So we need a particle number measurement like in the car sector. And um, yeah, and uh, in addition to the, the par uh, particles are measured in a complete um, in a, insufficient way. So the parts of the particles are not included in the, in the uh, measuring results, um, at, at least um, in the uh, measurement method used um, in Germany, for instance. Okay, thank you for that. Now, um, I, we had so many questions. I've tried to sort of fit, fit quite a few together. Um, uh, and we're also coming to the end and I would like to have some conclusions from Francois because obviously the EU is looking at this matter uh, and is, uh, uh, is looking to revise and possibly update things. So uh, it's important to hear about the messages he's taking away. Uh, but a couple of other things that came up, just, just to points that I would like to just share with you all and not get any reaction right now, but uh, is that indoor air pollution is also 
also affected by my smoking, by candle burning, and how can we actually understand where the pollutants are coming from indoors? So that's obviously another issue as well. And obviously, if you're a very bad cook, you have like burning food as well. Um, so, you know, that those are all problems as to how to tease out where this air pollution is coming from. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Francoise for literally just a, a minutes of roundup, uh, and, and then we'll come to the end of this session. Thank you very much, Aminda. Yeah, I'll try to be very short. It was a very dense session, and I think that the topics that have been mentioned, you know, relate to all dimensions of the issues, from the standards, the responsibility of consumers, but also producers, maintenance issues. Uh, there were calls for more EU action. We don't often see calls for more EU action. Sometimes we're told that subsidiarity should prevail, but we've heard calls for more actions. Um, questions linked to energy poverty, to the climate interface, so all of this is very relevant for us to, of course, take home. Um, I would like to highlight in particular the question of, you know, distinguishing myth from reality when it comes to bioenergy benefits. And that was very amply discussed today. And we need to be aware of the health effects of wood burning and I think publicize those more. And that was very, um, very eloquently put by some of the speakers. We also have heard about the fact that a lot of solutions exist that can limit as much as possible pollution from wood burning. And I think that, you know, there's a whole rollout of measures that could be developed that some of you have called for that we need to look at, we need to consider from installers, certifications, good maintenance and use, uh, awareness uh, for consumers, and all of this we need to work on. That is very clear from the Commission's perspective. We've heard about the importance of clear, up-to-date and ambitious legislation on eco-labeling and on eco-design. Our colleagues from DGN are not with us today, but we're working very closely with them in the lead on that, on the revision of the eco-design legislation, because it's very clear that more needs to be done. And I think that you've made a very, very strong appeal for that to be happening as swiftly as possible. From the implementation side, we've also heard about the importance of looking at local circumstances, looking at specific constraints, but also looking at proper measurements, proper assessments of the real impacts. That is something that we need to look at. And in doing so, we, we need to, of course, also understand that the issue of wood burning and the conditions in which it is being enjoyed is, of course, to be maintained, but in a way that doesn't hinder our air. So this is what we will be working towards. Thanks a lot for very valuable inputs. Thank you. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring it to a close. I thank all the speakers for their uh, fantastic contributions, a very complicated uh, subject with a lot of different areas. Thank you for sending in your questions. And with that, I now close this session.